This is Words Aptly Spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25:11. The word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. Well, welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney, Tim Knotts, and I discuss books from the Classical Conversations Curated Curriculum. Today is Wednesday, January 3rd, 2024. Welcome New Year. I'm Lee Bortons, and today we're also going to be joined by CCMM Curriculum Developer, Lisa Bailey. Jennifer, tell us about this month's shows. All right. So this month we're focusing on what we would call resources for younger learners, but I think we'll find that they are appreciated and delighted in by learners of all ages. <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to give that heads up so that they, our younger parents could really be listening in. So we have scribblers today, scribblers recipes from lifelong learners. And then we're going to do next week, the writing road to reading, which is a classic book on phonics. And then we're going to take on some different readers on literature, science, and history. So we'll have ancient world echoes exploring insects with uncle Paul, and then we'll finish up with Kings of Rome. Thanks. I can't wait. You know, those are the right age for my grandbabies. And so we've been touching some of those. Okay. Well, you can access this episode and all the past episodes on my YouTube channel. It's at Lee Bortons. And you also can go to my website, leebortons.com. Um, there's also the list of upcoming books for the year in case you want to go ahead and purchase any of them. They're linked to the CC Bookstore. All right, Jennifer, let's get started. All right. Well, you know what I'm going to ask? Why is Scribblers at Home, Recipes from Lifelong Learners, part of the Classical Conversations curriculum? We know it's interesting because the word curriculum really means a course that you run. And the Scribblers isn't truly meant to be a curriculum or a course that you run. That's why we have the subtitle was um, Recipes from Lifelong Learners. And what we wanted to do was a couple of things. One, we get uh, parents who are real excited about the Foundations and Challenge program and have uh, younger children also in their family, and they're wondering, what can I do to prepare them? We're also in a world where a lot of parents were raised by technology, and they're not quite used to being serendipitous and using the resources that aren't electronic to engage their children. And three, we wanted them to see as they prepared their children by doing just at-home activities um, and uh you know, that the, as a family, they were starting to get ready for foundations and challenge. So part of the book is for the student to give the parent activities to do with, as a family. And then part of the book is to prepare the parent for what's coming ahead. So a lot of times there's really great activity books out there for children, but nobody's showing a parent how that activity will help them learn Latin or help them to be better writers. And we wanted to bridge that gap of knowledge for the parents. Yeah, I love that. One of the fun things about working on it was that idea of um, starting where we are now and looking back and, and making those connections um, all the way through um, an education in our home. And what we found is that um, a lot of families started saving the activities for when dad was available or grandparents <laughs> so, that, so that they could really celebrate family learning. So that was a nice surprise for all of us. Well, I think what we're trying to do throughout all of CC is, um, uh, you know, as we've had this influx of homeschoolers who are, are sometimes homeschooling because they just won't send their kids to school. It's not really a life choice. We're trying to show them ways to be a family and bring education to the table and to the backyard and into the car that, you know, you're just learning anywhere you go. And that's why it's also not a curriculum. It's not a standardized course of study. You should be able to just open up to any page in the book and find an activity to do. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I love that idea of serendipitous. It's one of my favorite words. <laughs> so Lisa, you um, were um, sort of the lead of our writing team. So tell tell our listeners what it was like to be, to work on this book and what kind of memories you have of that process. Well, it was a ton of fun, and I just got pulled into what Lee was saying again, because I remember um, several years ago when she first presented this opportunity to work on the uh, resource that she was just spinning all those great thoughts about families, and, and so, Lee, when you were talking, I found myself pulled in again um, to enthusiastic, enthusiastically embracing that. I remember that what we did first 
was we started pondering the questions that young families, I mean, particularly homeschooling, young homeschooling families wanted answers to, but really at the time, all families that were interested in home-centered education, even if it was in addition to, to public school or private school or church school, um, there were certain questions that, that families, that parents were always asking, what do I want my kids to know? Um, how am I going to teach them? Am I capable of doing this? Where can I get help? And what should my schedule be? And what should my curriculum be? We just remembered when we were all young homeschool mamas, um, the kinds of questions that we had. And so then it was a lot of fun to sit around with three or four of us and really take our years of hard-won experience and answer some of those questions that we knew that families really needed to consider. Sometimes there's a difference between the questions families want answers to and what they come to recognize they really needed to know. So we thought, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about what do I wish that I had known then? What do I wish somebody had told me? What would I do differently if I could go back? Or what would make this homeschooling journey an even more delightful journey? Um, and so one of the things we hit on was that Scribblers was all about giving families permission to slow down, to explore more, um, to talk to each other more, to, to make time to play. See, that's what I wish somebody had told me as a young mama, that you need to take advantage of every opportunity to be playful with your children, even as you approach all these things you want your children to learn. You need to take the time to enjoy the journey, not just finish the journey. When our kids are little and we're just starting out, we, have, we look way down the road and we think, oh, my gosh, I have only 12 years, right? And we're looking, and I'm not saying we don't look at the finish line to inform our milestones, but we need to live more in the moment. So we started with that kind of philosophy, but then when we really started putting some structure to the book, um, we thought about, okay, what are the basic skills, what's the basic information for each subject or each strand that we really feel like is important, and then we just designed playful ways to enjoy building those skills intentionally through playing with our kids. Oh, yeah, that's really good, and that... Um... That, that's a good segue into Tim telling us about the content and the play between those two ideas that you just mentioned. Where are we going and what can we do now? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that was really good. So Tim, tell us what is in the book. What are its parts? So I actually really love the subtitle of the book. Um, we all, I think, go around calling it Scribblers, rightly so, but the recipes <laughs> from lifelong learners piece is really helpful for understanding what's inside um, that mm. you know, sort of each page or each activity is its own little packet of things that can be done by itself or in conjunction with others. Um, you know, at, at our house, we have some some kids who are about the age where they're starting to want to explore the kitchen and do some cooking and baking. Um, and we've got a great big yellow cookbook that has all kinds of basic recipes, you know, basic pancakes, basic white cake, basic, you know, all, all sorts of things that then <laughs> once you've explored the basic thing, you can then start to explore adding twists to it or, or fancy elements. Um, and this book is, is a lot, this, the Scribblers book is a lot like that. It has a lot of things in it that give you something that will produce something, but also can be explored and expanded on. Um, and it's and it's all fun and it's all connected, um, so it's not random. Even though it can be done in in little bits and pieces, um, so so inside it has a lot of different kinds of things. It has um, poems, twenty twenty four different poems. It has uh, activities. Um, 
from each of the different areas of the classical conversations curriculum. Um, it has 96 total activities and then 96 charts. And so in, in those things, it has both that ability to feel very random or very spontaneous in the activities that you choose mm -hmm. what you want to do, but also a sense of organization that helps uh, a mom or a student who's looking for a way to understand the connectedness of what they're doing to the whole. Um, and of course, with our motto and, and who we are, uh, with Christ at the center, we have scripture that's also incorporated so that families can use it um, for sort of a whole a whole life activity. And it's not just limited to a spelling primer or uh, or a science workbook. It's, it's really a way to explore all kinds of aspects of life and to do it in a way that's both flexible, uh, but yet intentional. Yeah, I appreciate too that you did a great job, Tim, of pulling through the cookbook metaphor. Because <laughs> that's something that runs all through the Scribbler's curriculum is this idea of putting a, a feast before our kids, but um, maybe doing that a course or two at a time. So um, that cookbook metaphor is one that we um, pulled all the way through um, our recipes. So so Lee, tell us more about this idea of these 96 charts, because if I look at the Scribbler's curriculum, that might be the least um, intuitive piece of it for some families um, to have these, you know, we have 16 charts that are about history, science, literature, phonics, Latin, um, things that you may not associate with preschool. So what, what are these charts doing there? Why did you feel strongly about giving these to families? So when I was first preparing to homeschool my boys back before they were four or five years old, I was using the writing road to reading and I had the phonics chart memorized. I was going through Latin curriculum. I was a new Christian and I was memorizing Bible verses with our little boys. Um, I prepared for what they were going to be doing. And this is, remember, pre-internet and back in the 80s. And so when we're reading books like in Challenge A or B, I forget which it is, and we do little, we read little britches and the mother takes the kids outside for a picnic and they're so, they're, they just play with sticks and rocks while they listen to her recite the, um, the Battle of the Light Brigade. And, you know, a homeschooling mom now might go, I don't even know what that is, let alone, there's no poetry I recite. So we have poems and activities in here that look like they're for the children, but they're really so that the parent can start filling themselves up with copious words, ideas, so that on the spur, in the, that spontaneity, when your children ask a question, or they're restless, or they need to have... Um, you know, a little bit of self-control because they're in an uh, unusual situation. Mom has uh, at her fingertips activities and things to do. And they're not just activities and things to do, but they actually will prepare the children for what they're going to be doing through high school. Um, well, through, I should say for foundations and challenge specifically. So it's really kind of a difficult thing to do because a lot of people think that um, children's books are for children. And I've yet to met one that was. They're usually for the parent that's reading or sharing it with the child so that they can become a better learner, listener, share, and have that wealth of just stories and activities that make it so the kids want to be with their parents. Um, and just makes it so you're more interesting in your parenting. So that was one of the reasons, like, just philosophically why I wanted them there. I wanted to, and like the the Charge of the Light Brigade is a long poem. These poems that we have in here are short. They're places where you can begin. We don't have the entire writing road to reading list in here, but you should be able to say a a a b k s d a e. See, from all these from forty years ago, I still have that thing memorized. <laughs> so it's just the basics, so that you as a parent know. Oh, this might be where my child's struggling. They don't know the phonics. One thing that people don't aren't familiar with and why we put chain stories or chain poems into the book was it used to be you had a child memorize a chain poem. I'll give you an example in a minute. And then that's what you taught them to read from. Because if it was in their heart and in their mind, the words and the rhythms and the patterns, then you put it on what's much more difficult visually on paper. They had that peg to attach to. 
So a chain poem might be something like there's a log in the bottom of the sea, there's a frog on the log in the hole in the bottom of the sea, however, you know, that one goes. So it's just chock a block of ideas so that the parents can be better homeschoolers and see the begin to see the purpose of just play, like Lisa talked so much about, with their children that are young, because it's play is really the best way we learn anything. So we're trying to give you some toys to play with. Yeah, that's good. And we'll talk more about attention here in a little bit. But um, one of the things that I think that charts do for families is help you attend to things. So I'll just take the literature ones as an example. Um, We have a chart on setting and one on character and one on plot and one on conflict and one on theme. Um, That's not to say that that's all you would ever need to know about a story. That was not the point of the chart. The point is, if you have some questions to start with about setting, then when you sit down in the park or the library to read a story with your kids, and you have one that has a really strong setting, then you have a few questions in your heart that you can start with to have that little gentle discussion with your kids, where you can ask some questions about the theme. What lesson should your family Um, What's a lesson that your family can learn from this book about how to live differently or make better choices or avoid bad choices? (laughs) There's so much children's literature is about avoiding the bad choices. And so those charts Mm -hmm. are there, uh, as you said, Lee, to give you those those things to hold on to so that you can attend better when you are walking in the woods or reading a story or playing with numbers and looking for patterns. So. Well, good. Well, we've talked a little bit about this idea of the whole family, Lisa, and the whole whole life and not just an educational mm-hmm. curriculum. And I know that one of the things you you wanted to make sure we included were five verbs that you have associated with scribblers. So you can you tell us about those and why you thought they were important? Yes. Um, in the years I spent traveling the country talking to families um, at practicum, I always had moms who came up, um, moms of little kids, you know, four, five, six, seven-year-old children who would come up and they would be so burdened because they would always tell me that they feared they hadn't done enough. And they would tell long stories about, um, you know, they got to the end of the day and they were discouraged because they looked at how many math equations had not been explored and um, how many pages of reading we didn't get to and we didn't finish our essentials charts or whatever it was they had set themselves to do. And I've realized over the years that we were discouraging ourselves. We weren't looking Mm -hmm. at all the great things that we were doing, all the relationships that we were building, all of the rabbit trails that we chased and found delight in. And so as we, as we wrote, um, I thought it's really important that we encourage parents to believe in themselves, to understand that they are doing a great and wonderful work by spending their lives learning beside their children. And so we came up with these five verbs and we would say to people, you know what, at at the end of the day, you have done these five things, then you have, in fact, done enough. And so the five verbs are pray, play, read, explore, and serve. So pray, if every day you look up, you know, together, seeking God, um, if we pray and let God call us into using his power to affect the lives of others and to change the world, then that's been a good thing. If we play together every day, if we just relax and and intentionally be silly sometimes and work our imagination muscles, that is a good day. If we read together every day and in some way we ponder a new idea or a new situation, or we savor some really cool words together and some really um, life-changing stories, if we live vicariously situations that we may never encounter in real life, then that's been good. If we explore together, if we get outside or, or even stay inside 
but get our hands dirty. If we look and listen and smell and taste and touch together and talk about what we're experiencing, that's been a good day. And then at the end of it all, if we have served together, if we have looked around, if we have together worked to become God's hands and feet, you know, if we teach our family, if we teach our children to serve their family first, then their church, then their community, then their world, then we have done a great thing and we have helped to um, grow some wonderful humans. Yeah. I love that. So we'll say them again. I, I'm going to see if I can get them for me, Lisa. Pray, play, yeah. read, explore, and serve. Yay, you did it. Good. See, nice. and they're easy to remember. They're easy to remember, and they're supernatural, supernatural things for families to do together and then feel good about what they've done together as a family. Mm-hmm. Good. I love that. Um I have a very fun memory of um, one of the times when Ben and I were exploring together. He's my firstborn. And when he was very little, we were reading blueberries for Sal. And I live in Oklahoma where we either have um, the opportunity to encounter bears in the woods nor pick blueberries. (laughs) And so I was thinking, (laughs) what can we do to make this story more active for him? And I had, I, I had a metal like hardware bucket out in the garage and we went out in the yard and we have a lot of oak trees. So we didn't gather blueberries. We gathered acorns because I wanted him to hear the sound hitting the bottom of the pail. (laughs) That was my whole goal because it's a big part of that story is hearing the blueberries hit the bottom of the pail. So we gathered acorns that day. He he still remembers that day as well. So I think that's that explore verb is very fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does anyone want to share, before we move into our close reading of the text, does anyone want to share either what you hope families will get out of the resource or a favorite aspect of the resource that you just want families to know about? So I'll share with um, one of the poems that are in the book. Um, It's called April Rain Song. And um, it's by Langston Hughes. First, he's a famous um, poet. So just, I want people to start to know the names of our writers and then that goes like this let the rain kiss you let the rain beat upon your heat beat upon your head with silver liquid drops let the rain sing you a lullaby and so many times you know hear parents say you can't go outside it's raining maybe reading that poem with your children will make it so you go oh it's raining run outside because it continues with the rain makes still pools on the sidewalk Did we lose Lee or did we lose me? <laughs> Tim, you're nodding. I think we lost Lee. I, I think Aww. we lost Lee. Okay. Well, we'll let her finish her poem when she comes back. Anyone else want to share a favorite aspect of the curriculum? Uh, I actually love it for what, um, it might have been you said earlier, Jennifer, but that it's easy to pick up. Um, maybe it was Lisa. Uh, on that busy day when things Mm -hmm. have sort of gone sideways in some ways and you're not sure (laughs) where to pick back up and try and get the wheels back on the bus uh and you don't have time to invent something yourself it's it's a Mm -hmm. great way to say all right well we can play this game or we can do this activity or we can just sit down quietly and read this poem and talk about it or look at this picture or review this Mm -hmm. chart of things that you you've already learned, but we're going to take the time to do some observation or some review or some um, expanding of what we already know. And uh, it, it takes some of that pressure of being the creative homeschooler away. And I know a lot of moms with young children that you, I mean, after you, feed them and bathe them and clean up after the feeding them and maybe rebathe them again (laughs) and change diapers, the energy to then be creative and come up with a thing to do is just sometimes beyond you. And uh, this is a great resource for, for that, to, to find something that's doable and you don't have to invent it. Yeah, that's good. And Mm -hmm. we tried hard to make sure that the 
supplies weren't vast because that also can be overwhelming. And there are a lot of activity books out there on the market where you have to have a lot of things and plan way ahead. And we were trying to say, no, what are things that we know will be ready to hand (laughs) that you can grab and do and not um, add that extra burden on, but just be fun. So, well, how about you, Lisa? What's a favorite thing for you? Well, one of my favorite things um, is that this is a resource that makes it super easy for other people to join you in the delight of family learning. So if if your sister or your brother come to town and they want to play with your kids and they want to be part of your homeschooling, but they don't know the timeline song and they don't know where you are in math, they can easily pick up this book and play a game um, that is fun, that is easy to understand. And like you said, Jennifer, doesn't need a lot of supplies that they have to gather or bring with them, but they can have fun doing it all together. Um, and it's the same thing. Grandma can, if you have a grandchild that you don't live near, get a scribblers and take it with you when you visit. There will always be something that you can do to play with your children, um, to play with your grandchildren. And it's super fun. And it is, it, that favorite part goes along with another favorite part to me. The five core habits run all through the Scribblers curriculum or the Scribblers resource. And and it really helps us as grownups tune back in to those five core habits that are really still important for us, but it also helps our little children. It helps to sort of encourage them to attend to all the things that they hear and see and smell and, and, and try in ways that they're good at. So the activities are things that they can do, but it encourages them to build these habits of attending and naming and all of that. Yeah, I love that. A time and time to to build those new habits together as a family. Very good. Yeah. Um, um, I won't add too much except to say that I love the variety. There are some things that are best done outside, some things that can be done in the car, some things that can be done inside mm-hmm. on a rainy day, um, some poems that are have fun sounds, some that would be fun to illustrate, some that even teach you Latin vocabulary. So there's just such a Ooh. delightful wide range of things to explore in here that um, I love that about it. Well, it is time to thank our sponsor, classicalconversationsbooks.com, where all of the books from our Words Aptly Spoken can be purchased. And the entire 2024 calendar is now at leebortons.com. And every episode has a link to the CC Book site so that you can buy um, any of the resources mentioned and prepare. But um, you can also just listen without preparing. So we welcome you either way. And so next week, if you do want to pull out your book, we're going to look at The Writing Road to Reading by Romalda Spalding, which, as we mentioned, has is a really good um, text for teaching kids to read phonetically. So let's get back to our discussion, guys. Um, now we usually look at a text when we're um, when we're reading a long book. So I pulled a few passages and things for us to look at. So um, Tim, do you want to read us this first passage? Sure. This is from the introduction. It says, educating your children can be like planning a banquet, a feast you are continually preparing, celebrating the wonder, delight, learning, and warm relationships you want to enjoy as you raise your children. Scribblers at Home, Recipes from Lifelong Learners, is in the inspired yet tried and true cookbook that helps you prepare for a feast. Let's begin with a question. What do you want your children to know? So I have to confess that when we were working on this metaphor, I kept thinking about one of my friends did a workshop and this was many years ago at our state homeschool convention. And the title of her workshop was what you mean I have to feed them too? (laughs) So her session was actually about how the busy homeschool mom with a large family can do meal prep. But um, I I always think about that because on on either end, um, we're going to be thinking what I have to do that too. So (laughs) Uh, but this makes it 
um, super fun and, and delightful and natural. So mm-hmm. how about you, Lisa? Thoughts on this quote? Um, I, I like it. I like it because it does start where most of us started. Um, what do we want our children to know? Um, and, and it helps us to recognize that um, just like a feast has a lot of parts and it, it's not over in a minute, it lasts for a while, so is educating our children. It's a continual preparing. Um, and and so educating our children is sort of like a banquet and Scribblers is kind of like a cookbook that helps us get ready for that feast. And so it starts where we all start. What is it you want your children to know? I, think it, I mean, if you want to extend the metaphor a little bit, I mean, you could say the same thing. What do you want your children to eat? Right. When we, when, yeah. we tra- when we teach our children to come to the table and we put food in front of them, uh, you know, they want mac and cheese at every meal. <laughs> um, right. And we say, no, that's not OK. You can't have just mac and cheese. At every meal. Sometimes you can have mac and cheese and that's fine. But but we're going to prepare all kinds of different dishes for you to learn to enjoy. Some of them you're going to enjoy naturally and some of them we may have to work out a little bit. Um, but it's mm-hmm. but it's for your good to have that whole balanced diet. And I think that that's a, a lovely thing here, too, with this book, is that if you don't just do section one, but you work your way around the book uh, and try different things, you're getting a little bit of a lot of different stuff that's all good for you and good for different parts of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. The cool thing- oh, go ahead, Lisa. The cool thing about a recipe is that once you master the basic recipe, like you were saying earlier, Tim, your family can add their own seasoning to it, their own flavor. And so that is cool in that because it means that every one of these activities can be done multiple times and it will turn out different every time, depending on what you bring to it and how old your children are and how much they put into it. And um, I just, I just think it's, a cool way to flavor. We can all be learning about, I don't know, the Mayflower Compact, but we might all have a little bit different take on it and the way we present it and our takeaways from it might all be a little bit different because our families are all a little bit different and that's okay. Yeah, it's good. I I was going to say, Tim, your, your analogy reminds me of, um, you know, training kids palates. Cause that's kind of where you were going with the whole mac and cheese. Yes. Years ago, I read a book called French <laughs> kids eat everything, um, which was kind of making its way around parenting circles. And um, one of the points they made is that when their children are very small, like toddler age, they'll give them strong foods like blue cheese. So it always, in, in my head, that analogy extends maybe to something like Latin or, um, Math, something we might consider to be, yeah, something harder or more remote from us that um, young children don't think in those categories. They're receptive to all the new things. And so if you read them a children's version of a Shakespeare story, they can, they'll delight in it just like they would a fairy tale or anything else that they have this amazing capacity to take in new things. And so you do want to introduce some of those things. If they're playing a Latin finger rhyme, like what we have here in scribblers, they're not going to be thinking what our older kids are thinking, which is Latin is hard or it's work. They're, they're thinking, this is really fun. I'm learning, I'm learning some words that are fun to say like Knox for night and Vox. Um, and, and so that's, it's this, this precious time when we can introduce and, and open up those things to their educational palette. So that's a nice extension of the analogy. All right. Well, Lisa, you talked to us early on about the five core habits of grammar and how these are woven through the scribblers. So um, because we have definitions of those a lot of places in the scribblers introduction and in the CC catalog, I thought it might be fun for you to instead um, tell us the sample questions that you gave the audience in the introduction for each of those five core habits. I would love it. So I'll read the question and you guys tell me which of the five core habits 
this oh, question would really employ. How about that? All right. All right. So what is what is the name of that flower? Well, that one gave it away. That's got to be naming. <laughs> Right. I, I thought I'd start easy on you. Okay. Who is <laughs> I'm glad I took that one then. That we, I know. Who is in the story that we just read? That's probably also naming. Uh, though Good job. I was trying to be tricky. Yeah, well, it though it does require some degree of attending to have paid attention to who what names you heard along the way. But I think asking for them to tell you back is naming. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Just like what noises did you hear <laughs> or what did you see in that tree? Um, those are attending questions too. What about this? What other story does this one remind you of? That one's harder, mm. but you have to have some other stories in your memory in order yes. to make that connection. So um so I would go with memorizing. Yeah, I think that is memorizing. So would this, if you ask this question, will you sing me the song that we learned yesterday? That's also memorizing because we learned it and now I'm asking you to recite it again. What about this one? How does the wind make you feel? Mm. I think in expressing question yeah right they need to yeah to explain something in in words that isn't isn't words in the first place exactly they are expressing a feeling or an idea in a different way um so you could also ask what do you see or what do you hear or smell or feel or taste depending on what you're doing, what kind of question is that? That could be tricky. Because you are asking students to attend. Yeah. And then you're asking. That you're also using all your senses. Yeah. So you, you have to attend and then express. So yeah. Go expressing. yeah, that's where you end up. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Good. And then the simple one that is another really obvious one. Will you tell me a story about this? Storytelling. Yes. Many yeah, of our so many of our children's favorite of the yes. <laughs> of them. I was, I was just thinking <laughs> yeah. that. Smiling as you asked that question, Lisa, because um we always cultivated the habit of telling stories um, around the dinner table. And when our youngest one is quite a bit younger than our oldest, she's 10 years younger. And so she obviously was hearing and picking up on the pattern, yes. but for years she told all of her stories in the third person. So she would say things oh like, my God. and she would always also tell the opposite of what had actually happened. I think in an attempt <laughs> to escape consequences. So a common story at the dinner table might be, um, and I'll just say her by name. Cause y'all all know who she is by now. <laughs> But she would say things like, <laughs> Mia did not cross the street without looking today. <laughs> <laughs> but all of her stories, she would always tell about her day. And it was always in the third person. And my husband started to worry about her. And I was like, no, I think she's just copying us because we tell lots of stories yes. about the baby. <laughs> so she's just copying right. the way. We well, she was narrating the life experience for somebody else. So it, it was... Yeah. She was reading it like it was a story. Yeah. Well, good. So those, those core habits um, are woven through. So we started off in the last section talking about the question, what do we want our kids to know? And so I guess this would be the, how do we want them to know it is that we name mm -hmm. things and attend to things and memorize and express and tell stories. Yeah. Those kind of habits are what really cultivate those good conversations. And really, those are the habits that will help our children keep exploring new ideas and being able to talk about them in different ways. Yeah. And, and all just natural things that you would do, right? We all have had the experience. Yeah, absolutely. A bird comes to the window and the child says, what is that? 
daddy. And daddy says, it's a Robin. That's so naming things mm-hmm. for our kids is just normal. And so we just extend it into some new activities. Very good. All right. Well, I'm going to read our next quote about um, atmosphere and family rhythms for us to discuss. And then we're going to try to discuss it quickly because I really want us to practice one of the activities that's <laughs> here. So um, I don't, did I put the page number down? I don't know if I did. It's in the, it is in the introduction though. As you discover your family's purpose and priorities, your family's dynamics and uniquenesses, you will begin to find your rhythm for daily living in the same way that a daily rhythm of meals and snacks helps your children stay healthy and happy. A daily rhythm of learning together is at the core of a healthy education. A key place to begin, creating a family atmosphere. What will make your home an inviting, welcoming, nurturing place for resting, working, playing, praying, and learning every day? It is our relationships that draw us into learning. What thoughts and activities keep relationships at the forefront? So there's a lot of ideas in that short quote. Um, Tim, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I mean, I think this is great for us as parents to be able to understand that we're both teachers, like we're leading our children into understanding and maturity. But at the same time, we also need to be fellow learners that we walk alongside Mm -hmm. our children Mm -hmm. and discover wonderful things in God's creation and the world around us and stories and, and that we do it in both capacities. And I think having the relationship uh, both of those relationships nourished from the beginning. Um, that's a great foundation for us as homeschoolers, that there are things mm-hmm. that mom and dad will just straight up teach along the way. And there are other things that we'll have to explore and learn together. Um, and and knowing that there's both um, and that there's freedom in having both is an important part of this home, our home being a nurturing place for resting and learning together. Mm. Yeah, that's really beautiful, Tim. I think it's important for us as parents to realize that this whole idea of lifelong learning is caught before it is taught. Mm. If your children see you reading and exploring and praying, and serving, um, and playing, then they're going to think that's what a family does. I, I can remember my girls just telling people, oh, yeah, we do have a lot of books at our house. We just read. We learn things together. That's just what we do. And, the, and she was, my daughter was very matter of fact about that. That's just what we do. But the whole idea that you can build a family culture of learning by the way you start the day and maybe by the way you end the day and the way you spend the day together um, is a way to build a family culture of learning where we just learn stuff together. That's what we do. Yeah, that's good. We're all honing in on a different part of it. So I was going to talk about the rhythm um, because Mm -hmm. I think that as I probably one of the biggest lessons for me looking back, having graduated three of my kids is that when I first started, I wanted to bring school home. And so every year I wanted Mm -hmm. to have an hour by hour schedule that everyone complied with. And I soon realized that that's not really family, what family learning looks like. It's not really what life with young children looks like. Um, And so we, I focused (laughs) less on my schedule, although we did have certain things that we did in order. I focused less on being stressed about that and more in cultivating those habits of how we learned together and also just the rhythms. So this, the Mm -hmm. hour by hour schedule became, we get up, we read the Bible together, we read a story together, and then we do our math. <laughs> and then it was much less stressful. Right. It was our rhythm in our home of, of um, the approach to the day. And then when the rhythm was broken because of illness or a new baby or helping a family member, mm-hmm. it was really easy to return to it. And so um, I think that rhythm and your atmosphere are super important over and above trying to bring school and a school schedule home. So, yeah, yeah. And for most of us, those 
two things are hard one lessons. Yes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you have to try a lot of things before you know it works. You do. Um, yep. All right. Well, Tim, in our last few minutes, we're going to do one of the activities, which is called the great serial debate. And it's on page 258 for those of you who are listening and have a scribbler's curriculum. So Tim, tell us how we play this act, this game. This is a, this is a fun one. I appreciate this because this is uh, <laughs> a common experience for any of us who have more than one child who doesn't always get what they want at the grocery <laughs> store. Um, yep. So this is a great way to introduce um, debate and helps to build communi communication skills. Um, the idea is that before you go to the grocery store, yeah, each child in your house, or maybe each family member, doesn't have to be limited to the children, gets to make a pitch for the breakfast cereal that they'd like to bring home that day. So they introduce themselves, they identify the cereal, they give their reasons for why that one particular cereal should be the one, and then they conclude with answering questions from the audience. And then mom or grocery store grocery store going parent gets to choose amongst the options um, and should give praise for what went well, uh, even when the child didn't win the debate um, and, and perhaps even offer suggestions on what would be more uh, persuasive next time. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to show children how to argue for something but not be argumentative, which is a really important life skill. We want our children to be able to argue well but not to argue yeah. purposelessly. Um, they practice some some basic skills like taking a few notes on a note card, um, you know, making good eye contact, things that will benefit them as public speakers, as doing foundations presentations later, um, and speaking with notes, but out without without reading from a script, um, and it helps them to see how to listen and ask questions and to deliberate over an answer if if mom or dad is is doing their part of judging well so we're going to practice we're going to do a little uh, a little serial debate um so <laughs> sh shall i go first jennifer or would you like to go first all right it's up to you you're leading this activity all right well, i'll do mine and then we can go for there lisa i guess you're our, are you our judge for today are you are you mom <laughs> oh i could be that's so funny I, I was i had already been marshalling my arguments for my favorite cereal but i can definitely be the judge in either way but i'll, I'll start off and then you can make your choice hello okay. my name is timothy i am proposing that we should bring home kicks cereal for three reasons First, I have been assured that it is kid tested. All the kids in our family enjoy its flavor. Second, it is mother approved. It is not a sugar cereal. Third, we have not had it in the last month, while other cereals have been purchased in that time. In summary, it's tasty, it's healthy, and it's good timing in the rotation of the cereals that we buy. Thank you for listening, and I'm ready to answer questions. Right. So, so, what you decide to do? Um, to present. Um, what do you? Well, let me ask you, Jennifer. Do you have a? Do you have a preference? Um, I mean, like, do you want to present? Well, I kind of do. Will you be sad? Okay. Then, no, I will not be sad. And and if I am, one of the things that you practice in this debate is um, polite responses if your choice is not supported. So I'm perfectly happy for you to go next, Jennifer. Okay. Well, I'm a little worried that one of my reasons is not as convincing as Tim's, <laughs> but I will, I will present my reasons. And this actually is from a story that happened in our home. So when we're through, I'll maybe Ooh. tell them the story. But, um, so I'm going to say, hello, my name is Jennifer. But really, if I were telling this truthfully, it would be, hello, my name is Ben. <laughs> And I'm presenting the reasons <laughs> that Fruit Loops are better than Cheerios, <laughs> and so therefore we should bring <laughs> Fruit Loops. Um, so Fruit Loops are better than Cheerios for us to bring home this week from the store because they are colorful, and we can actually spend time at the breakfast table learning our colors and sorting them. Um, Fruit Loops are better for us to choose this week than Cheerios because they are sweet and we have been very good and we've had very few sweets this month. So we deserve a treat. 
And finally, Fruit Loops are educational. There are activities on the box. So while I'm eating my Fruit Loops, I can be learning at the breakfast table. So those are my three reasons that we should choose Fruit Loops this month. And I am now ready for you to ask your questions. <laughs> this is too funny. You have no, no one will ever know how closely aligned my example and your example would have been. But so that's good so that only one of us got to go. Um, so let me ask you first, Jennifer, if you have any questions for Timothy about his proposal. So my question is, you said that kicks are nutritious. Do they taste good? I think they're delicious. Okay. Are they as sweet as Fruit Loops? They are not as sweet as Fruit Loops. But they are sweeter than Cheerios. Okay. Good. <laughs> those are my, those are okay. all my questions. <laughs> so Timothy, do you have any questions for Jennifer about her proposal? Um, yeah, is it really just that you want to drink the sugary sludge at the bottom of the bowl after you've eaten all the, the <laughs> Fruit Loops? <laughs> um, if I'm honest, I do like sweet milk, so <laughs> part of it, but I do think they're very fun to sort, so... It's not my only reason, but it's definitely a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. Well, so the hardest part of this whole activity is probably going to be for mom or dad or whoever grocery parent is, um, because both of you presented very compelling reasons. You gave me, um, you gave me really good information about the cereals. I got lots of the features, but you also gave me the benefits. Like from Jennifer, I learned that um, there were games. It was educational, which is a feature. Uh, the feature is that there are games and stories on the back of the box. And the benefit is that I would be doing constructive things while I'm eating my breakfast by practicing those my reading and figuring out those stories. So that's really good. Um, and Timothy was very persuasive and that he brought in the timing of it all. Um, it has been quite a while was the reminder since we had this cereal, whereas other cereals have been chosen previously. Um, and that is a highly compelling argument. But I have to say that I did appreciate all the educational benefits provided by the Fruit Loops, the, the color and the sorting by color um, and the reading. So I think that this week we'll buy Fruit Loop. All right. So Ben would have been so happy with you. Um, that my <laughs> argument was inspired by a true story, which is that I put Cheerios on Susanna's high chair tray one day. And I turned my back to finish breakfast for everyone else. And when I turned around, her tray was covered in Fruit Loops. And I said to Benjamin, do you know anything about this? Because when I turned my back, those were Cheerios and they're now Fruit Loops. Some kind of magic trick has, has happened. And he said, well, she wanted Fruit Loops and I want to give her what she wants. So, Oh my goodness. I suggested that perhaps I that was that. the best strategy for us to use while, um, you know, rearing our little baby <laughs> sister that maybe she couldn't have everything she wanted. So. <laughs> right. She had never had sugar, by the way, until that moment. But by the time I turned around, it was too late. So anyway, well, that was fun. This is actually a game we play at the dinner table all the time because Mia likes to um, have to practice debating. And we like this short form of introduce yourself, give your three reasons, and then see if everyone has questions. And so we play this game at the dinner table quite a lot. I think it's really cool because it will begin to teach even young learners that it might, your, your three reasons might depend on which parent has brought you to the store. So it, it really on an early end teaches them to know their audience and what would be persuasive to the person they're presenting to. Yeah. That's to move, it. to move past the, because I want it or because it tastes good to me yes. is, is an important step for a child. 
Yes. Yep. And absolutely. In our house, Tim would have convinced me to buy kicks and yep. my husband would have been persuaded yep. about the fruit looms. <laughs> so yes, that it tells really you something about our, our yeah. audience. Yep. Yeah. Well, good. Well, you guys, this was tons of fun. I think we're a little bit over time, so we'll close it out for today. Tim, thanks for leading us through our activity and Lisa for judging. Um, this was a fun discussion today and um, we will encourage our listeners. You guys keep reading and keep the conversations going and we'll see you next time. So thanks guys. Thanks.